All right, gentlemen, we're right on schedule with where we're supposed to be. So we have the next two classes starting today devoted to the issue of the kingdom of God. So we'll be looking at a lot of text and theological issues related to that. When you look at the big <clears throat> themes of Scripture, uh, when it comes to the issue of the kingdom of God, clearly there's a lot of disagreement when it comes to what the kingdom of God is. Uh, obviously you have amillennial views and postmillennial views and premillennial views and within premillennialism there's historic premills and dispensational premills and so there can oftentimes be a lot of uh, debate and discussion. Uh, the good thing is is that on certain areas there is complete agreement, one of them Jesus being the ultimate son of David and that you know, he is going to come again uh, to establish, you know, a perfect and righteous kingdom and will eradicate, you know, sin for all time that will enjoy his presence forever. So as we talk about the differences, we also want to acknowledge that there's, you know, some important, uh, you know, agreements as well. But what we'll start today is working through some key passages related to the issue of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> this, what we're doing right here will be distinguished a little bit from what will come later on in the course, which will be an explicit discussion of millennial views. What we're going to be doing today is more broader uh, in the sense of trying to trace the kingdom plan in both the Old and the New Testaments. So, you know, Part of the reason I think why there's so much debate on the kingdom of God is because there are so many passages related to the kingdom of God. There's so many passages in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So sometimes certain people or certain groups will emphasize certain passages and others will emphasize others. But of course, what we have to do is we have to make sure that we're harmonizing all of them and doing it, doing it accurately. I also think how you view the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament will go a long way in determining you know, how you understand uh, the kingdom program. <clears throat> Again, the, the approach that we're arguing for here is later revelation builds upon the contextual and literal meaning of earlier revelation. That even includes Old Testament revelation. So when the New Testament comes on the scene, it may give new information, but it's not giving different information that what was given in the old and is actually building upon it. Uh, the other side at times we'll say that when, with the coming of the New Testament, it's transcending what was talked about in the old. So thus physical, national sorts of things can be transcended into you know, greater spiritual realities. What I want to do first in regard to this is there's so many places you can start and so many areas you can begin. I wanted to start it out here by talking about a progression, some big picture uh, ideas even starting in Genesis, and going all the way to Revelation 22. And the reason why I want to bring these up is these, in a sense, are big picture parameters that I think will help us as we're understanding what's going on with the kingdom program. Now, some of these passages we've looked at before, but um, bear with me as we look at these. As you can tell by now, I uh, make a big deal out of what's going on in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Because I, as I said before, I think this is the, the, really the charter given to mankind about, you know, what God wants them to do. So Genesis 1, creation account. And then remember in verse 26 that God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So, you know, we've talked about it before. I think that has uh, image, the image of God has kingdom implications. It has sonship implications. And what are they supposed to do? Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27 again it reiterates they made in the image of God. Verse 28 says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So rule and subdue. God, when he creates man... He wants him to be active. He wants him to, you know, and, and the concepts of the rule and the subdue are very active. They're very um, aggressive in a sense. Man, you know, is given charge over this creation that God has made, and he's supposed to rule over it for God's glory. A lot of people will say this passage indicates that man is a, is a vice regent. Uh, he, he's a king uh, with a small K as he serves the king, capital K. So that ends up being what he's supposed to do. Now we know according to Genesis chapter 3, man falls and then creation becomes cursed. 
in the ground that man was supposed to rule over, you know, we see that it's going to be working against him, so things get much more difficult. So, so with this, with Genesis 1, we're definitely seeing, you know, man, you know, the, is, is to rule and subdue creation. Now, when you come to Psalm 8, this passage is significant because it's a commentary on Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and since it's coming post-fall, we see that what God originally intended for man to do, there's still a relationship of man to these things. Now, don't un misunderstand me here. I'm not jumping off to post-millennial conclusions and saying that it's our duty right now as members of the church to try to you know, solve all of, all of the uh, environmental problems and societal problems. Uh, but there is still a relationship to the earth that is indicated uh, by Psalm 8. You know, the, it begins with our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. And then jump to verse 3, where it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. Now notice verse 6. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. So even post-fall, we see that there's significance there. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. And when you come up to you know, the latter part of verse 6, you have put all things under his feet. Verse 7, all sheep and oxen, and also the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So... Those themes of man having a relationship to the creation and being involved with those, those things have been granted to him, and there's still a relationship there. Now, of course, one of the issues that pops up is, but Lord, we failed, <laughs> we sinned, we've we haven't done what we've 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 supposed to what we're supposed to be doing. Well, there's there's still going to be a coming solution for that. But let's head now to Hebrews chapter two. Hebrews chapter two, which is going to pick up on. Psalm 8, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. Now we know in Hebrews that you know, the emphasis is on the superiority of Jesus Christ uh, to several things. But notice in verse 5, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For he, you know, referring to God, did not subject to angels the world to come. Now notice there, he's referring here to a, to a world that is coming. And, you know, one of the things we do see in Hebrews, I think in chapter 2 and chapter 13, is you do see some futuristic eschatology in the book. It's talking about the world to come. So, what God is saying here, you know, he, or the writer of Hebrews is saying, God did not subject the angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, and then you have a reference here, to Psalm 8. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So the reaffirmation of, of the creation account in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Now notice the rest of the verse. It says, for in subjecting, all things to him, <clears throat> he left nothing that is not subject to him. So God subjected all things, you know, to mankind. But notice at the end of the verse it says, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So you see the connection there? It's like God intended for man <laughs> to be involved with the creation and with the world. We know that there's been a fall. That hasn't changed the fact that there still is a relationship between man and what's going on with God's creation. In verse 5, it talks about, when we were over here, the world to come. So you see indications here that there's something's going to change in the world to come. And then in verse 8, we have the statement, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But what seems to be the implication of that last part? In the world to come, we will. So... That's why I say we got to have a proper understanding of where things are now and where things are headed. 
Now, at that particular point, I want you to turn over to the next part of the story, which is 1 Corinthians 15. This is where Jesus, the ultimate man, comes in. Let's face it, man on his own is not going to be able to, to do it as he should in his fallen state because he's already blown it. He's a sinner. That's will come the ultimate man. Jesus Christ is going to be uh, so important. Now, in verses 20 to 24, this is something we'll get into later. You get into the stages of the resurrection program. When we get into the discussion of the millennium, we'll talk about this passage because it's a, it's a heavily debated passage between amillennialists and, and premillennialists. But I want to draw your attention to verse 24. And verses 24 to 28, I think, is one of the great passages that actually indicates God's purposes uh, through Jesus Christ and what's supposed to be taking place. So what's referred to here, and I, I would say from my understanding of verses 20 to 24, there's three stages in the resurrection program. There's Christ, the fir first fruits, then those who are at his coming, then comes the end. Since there's been a gap of time between the first and the second stages, I think there's a, a gap of time between the second and the third, but that's an issue we'll talk more about later. But it talks about an issue here, you know, then comes the end. And theologically, just so you know, I would take that at the end of the millennial at the end of the millennium. Verse 24 says, Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father. So when the end comes, Jesus hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. So there has to be this time period. Not just an event, not just the event of the second coming, but a time period in which he is, he is reigning. He has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. And then in verse 25, it says, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26, The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now notice in verse 27, there's a quotation. You have a, a quote here, for, I think from Psalm 8. It's from Psalm 8, and I think verse 6. It says, For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now this is where I think you see that connection between man and Jesus is the ultimate man. Remember when man was created, all things were put in subjection under him. But we see that the ultimate man, Jesus, is the one that that really finds its culmination with. And I think because it'll find its culmination in him, he's also able to restore those who are his to have a right relationship to the creation. So, so you can see that it's ultimately pointing to Jesus. Verse 27, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that, that he is accepted who put all things in subjected to him, which is basically Paul's way of saying, you know, if God the Father is not put into subjection to the Son, uh, you know, he would be the one thing that would be the exception to that. Verse 28 says, when all things are subjected to him, you know, when all things have been subjected to the Son, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. What I like about that particular verse is it's telling us that it, it's, it, it's, like the, it's, it's like the Father has sent the Son on a rescue mission, or a fix-it mission. <laughs> uh, you know, some commentators often point out this would be pretty similar to a Roman general, or I'm sorry, a Roman emperor who would send a trusted Roman general to... to quash a rebellion, to squash a rebellion and to make things right, and when he does so, to come back to the emperor and say, you know, I've accomplished the mission. So when Jesus does this, when he's, you know, when he's reigned fully and perfectly and has subjected all things, you know, to him and things have been made right, he comes back to the God, the Father, you know, so that God may be all in all. So I think that's at the point where Matthew 6.10 finds its full Fulfillment, where you're praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you get to this particular point, everything is brought back into perfect conformity uh, in regard to this creation. So uh, very clear, I think, according to this passage, that Christ, the God the Father, intends for Christ to rule. It has relationship to this creation, and it has you know, connections going all the way back to the original mandate that was given to man. So once Genesis 3 hits, man's not able to do this as he's supposed to. But Jesus is able to come, and with his cross, and with what he does to restore all things, and to, I like the word, to calibrate it, <laughs> to make it work as it was originally 
uh, supposed to work. And then because Jesus does that, because he is the one who is able to accomplish that, when you get into Revelation, you'll see passages about how this, this affects those who belong to Christ. And I didn't mention Revelation 2, 26 to 27 up on the board, but I do want to mention it here. Like when you're dealing with the promise, this, this is a promise to the church of Thyatira, but I would take it to the church in general. Remember, the, uh, the church is a revelation. They're, they're going through persecution and difficult times, and so Christ comes and points out where they're wrong, encourages them where they're doing the well, and then he ends with these eschatological blessings for those that are the faithful. And then, you know, in verse 25, of Revelation 2. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. So that's Psalm 2, which is also talking about the reign of the Messiah. And then in verse 27, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. So basically, I think what's saying there is Jesus is going to share his messianic reign with those who belong to him. So, you know, Psalm 2, I think, has specific direct reference to Jesus the Messiah, but he's indicating here that when he comes to rule, he's also going to grant his servants to be reigning. And so, and the reason that he can do that is because he, he is the one. He's the ultimate man. He is the one who reigns uh, uh, perfectly. Now, again, I would draw your attention to Revelation 20. Not that this is our full-blown millennial discussion here. But the <clears throat> when you look at Revelation chapter 20, remember uh, end of Revelation 19 is talking about the second coming. Revelation 20 is talking about the thousand-year kingdom. And then when you get to Revelation chapter 20 verse 4, it talks about the saints reigning after Christ's return. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. And we're not going to go there, but in Revelation chapter 6, those were people that were, that were slain because of their testimony for Christ. Here they're resurrected and, they're, and at this point they begin to reign. And it says, and they had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So those, that, those who were slain uh, before the second coming of Christ, they're resurrected and allowed to reign uh, with him. And then if you look over at Revelation chapter 22, verse 5, again, even, even though there is uh, verses after Revelation 22, 5, Revelation 22, 5 is the last description of the new earth and the new Jerusalem on the new earth. So in a sense, it's, it's the very, very end. And notice what it talks about here. It says in verse 5, and, they will no long, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Isn't that interesting that when it ends, it talks about those that belong to God and to Christ, they're reigning. What, were they, what was man originally supposed to do in Genesis 1:26 26 to 28? He was to rule and to subdue. And then when you get to the very end, you see here that that's what the saints are doing. They are, they are reigning. Now, obviously, at that point, I don't think there's sin. So in a sense of punitive, negative aspects of reigning, I don't think you see that. But I think reigning can include uh, people doing what they're supposed to do and, uh, on the earth and in relationships with other people and fulfilling uh, completely and perfectly what God wanted them to do. So anyway, there's a lot more verses, and we'll be talking a lot more of those. But I just wanted to kind of show here that this is what was given. You know, you had the, the kingdom given. This was man supposed to do. You know, you have Genesis 3, you have the fall. Psalm 8 comes along and still says man still has a relationship to the creation. He's still supposed to rule over it. Uh, Hebrews 2 comes along and tells us that that's going to happen in the world to come. And that, you know, man still is related to the creation, although we don't see all things yet subjected to him. Jesus is the one who comes, and because he's ultimate man, he is the one who is able to, to, to do that. And as he does that, he delegates the ability to rule to those who are his. And therefore, I think you see the kingdom connection all the way from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. All right, any thoughts or questions on that? Yep. How does it, it work with men ruling over other men when we enter the uh, kingdom and everybody has overcome? 
Is that Revelation 2 passage makes that you'll rule over the nations and right. overcome? Right. But everybody in the millennium has overcome to get there. Yeah. At least at the start. But there will also be negative aspects I know. later. So do you think that's a reference to the negative aspects later on? I think, I think the Revelation 2, 26 to 27, because the millennium will eventually have people born into it, that some of them don't come to faith. There, there is, in addition to a heavily positive aspect, there's also a negative aspect of reigning. He must rule with a rod of iron. He must rule until all his enemies are put under his feet. So I think there is a negative aspect in the millennium. When you get to the eternal state, there is no negative aspect. But I, but I don't think reigning has to ha necessarily always entail a negative aspect. I, I think as you, just to use you and me as examples in the eternal state, we're still going to have certain giftings and callings and certain things that we're supposed to do for the glory of God. And as we're doing those things, there's a sense in which we're reigning. So if God designates a certain person to be a farmer or a musician or whatever, as they're doing that for his glory, that is a sense of reigning. That's a sense of mastery of that area. So to answer your, in short, I would say there is a negative element in the millennium, but there wouldn't be a negative aspect in the eternal state, but reigning is true for both. All right, let's go, Tavis. And Just Thomas. to follow up that, so yeah. what you're saying is it's, it's a subjection to one another, almost kind of reflecting how the Trinity, like the Son is subject to the Father, that type of a hierarchy. Are you talking about like what, in what area? Like in the eternal state or, or just, uh, you're talking about subjection. Yeah. Okay. I mean, or is everyone totally equal in the eternal state? I know that's getting into myself. Well, I think they're, I mean, clearly even now within the, I mean, even within the Trinity, there's always been subjection in the sense of functional roles. So that, so that's true. And uh, I think what, for, for, not that I have 1 Corinthians 15 up here. I, I, I think, I think in, the, in, in the context of all things being subject to him in regard to Christ and his rule. I mean, I, I think there's a sense in which man is called to subject the planet and to bring it into conformity perfectly with what God wants. Christ does that. So I think the subjection language is often used in that context. I would also say that I think there's an element of that's true in the millennium. Um, when it comes to the eternal state, I think you're, you're still going to have, people are still going to be different. So there's, there's, there's going to be unity, but there's still going to be diversity. There's still going to be nations and all that sort of thing. I would say the element, the negative element of subjection wouldn't be there, but there would still be, you know, functional roles and those sorts of things. Yeah. Thomas? So the, so the idea in Revelation 2 is that, I mean, he's talking to the present church. Right. Meaning they will be glorified saints in the millennium and the people they rule over, the nations they rule over, people who enter into the kingdom. So there is a distinction there that's different than 22, but what the reigning involves. Well, the, in a sense, different conditions, because the millennium is an intermediate state, it has elements. It has elements that are similar to the present age, and then elements that are similar to the eternal state. I think that's something you can have a mix of glorified and unglorified, because it's an intermediate era that has like elements of both. So, the my understanding would be is that this promise is for those who are part of the church, those who are going to escape the day of the Lord, and part of their reward is to have ruling functions on the earth when it takes place. So. All right, so that's kind of a big, big picture uh, connection. So that's I, I do believe kingdom program starts in Genesis one, and it goes through you know into eternity as discussed in uh, Revelation uh, twenty two. Okay, on page eighty four, that's where our kingdom notes begin. What I've done here is you know I've laid out several key parts of what I believe are accurate in regard to the kingdom story. You know, I, give you, I give you a little bit of history up front as far as uh, you know, understandings of, of, of the kingdom of God. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. I want to jump straight into you know, talking about what is, what is the kingdom of God. Alva McLean, in his book, The Greatness of the Kingdom, which I think to this day is still by far the best work on the kingdom of God, uh, ever written. Uh, he makes, he points out that when it comes to God's kingdom program, there's a sense in which you can look at two 
two aspects of God's kingdom. Uh, the first is what he refers to as the universal kingdom. Uh, the universal kingdom of, of God is the one in which God reigns over every detail of the universe. Psalm 103:19 says, you know, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. 1 Corinthians 29:12 and Daniel 4:34, you know, indicate that God has a sovereign rule over the entire universe. So there's a sense in which we can say that there's nothing that takes place that is outside of, outside of his sovereignty. Yet there's also a, a narrower aspect of the kingdom of God, of what McLean has referred to as the mediatorial kingdom, in which the kingdom of God is established on earth. And it is mediatorial in that God uses human agents to establish his rule. So as God makes this world according to Genesis 1, as we already talked about in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, he creates man in his image, and man has a, has a functional role over the creation, or you could even say over the kingdom. And because there ends up being a rebellion, the mediatorial kingdom of God on earth is going to be played out over time as the process of the restoration of all things takes place. So there's a sense in which nothing happens outside the sovereignty and the will of God but there's also a sense in which, under his sovereignty, God has you know, allowed the fall and for a rebellion to take place and for there to be a period of time and a series of events for the reversal or the, the reversal of those effects and the restoration of all things to take place. And so I really think the history of the, the progress of the mediatorial kingdom is the process by which all things are restored and... God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. When we look at the whole issue of this mediatorial kingdom of God, as I've showed right here, I think there's a sense in which it's unfolding all throughout history. But there are going to be certain points in history where there's some strategic developments within that. So because I actually believe there's a sense of a, the kingdom program is found in Genesis 1, uh, there's a sense in which, you, you know, there's a lot of aspects of it that even from our standpoint are, uh, are historical and have taken place. Um, okay, let's see here. You know, I mentioned on point B, the mediatorial kingdom amplified. Uh, you know, the story begins in Genesis 1, you know, with man's, uh, with the role that, we, that was talked about there. Uh, if you read in the first verses of Genesis chapter 9, you'll see a, a lot of the commands that were originally given to Adam are also repeated to Noah in regard to his relationship to creation and uh, the filling uh, and subduing of the earth. I definitely think Genesis chapter 12 is closely connected with the kingdom program. I won't repeat everything here because we spent a whole day on the Abrahamic covenant. But the remember what we've been arguing is that it's through the covenants that we see the development of the kingdom program in history. So as the Abrahamic covenant comes on the scene, it's not like, oh, this is, some, this is a, a separate entity that God, something different God is doing from his kingdom program. No, the Abrahamic covenant ends up being how the kingdom program, you know, is, uh, is in play and how it's working out. And one of the things that we talked about in the Abrahamic covenant is that as God plans to restore all things, you know, he narrows in on Abraham and the nation that will come from him. Remember in Genesis 10, you have the table of nations, which indicates that God is concerned with all the nations of the earth. But then from one of those comes Abraham and then the great nation that will develop from him. The great nation that will come from him through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be the nation Israel. And there's going to be a land that is given to them. And so I believe that Israel and Israel's land ends up becoming the microcosm and the beachhead through which God is going to implement his kingdom plan to bless all the nations of the earth. So he narrows in with Israel and their land to be a microcosm of what he's doing for all nations and, and their lands as well. Deuteronomy 30, we've already spent several times looking at that passage. That, so I'm going to refer you back to some of the other messages where that's where you see God's big picture plan with Israel, which includes them becoming a kingdom. But if they were to disobey, they would be kicked out of the land. But then eventually someday they would be restored. 
I also mentioned here, you know, with Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, when Israel goes from being a people to being a nation, where they actually get a constitution in a sense, which is the Mosaic law, en route to the land that they will be getting eventually with the promised land, you know, they become a nation in a truest sense. And they're told in Exodus 19, 6, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So as God is beginning the process of the restoration of all things and the blessing of all the families and the nations of the earth, he's starting with Israel. He's calling them apart. They're going to have a mission in which if they do things right, they're going to be a witness to the greatness of God and a vehicle to uh, you know, blessing other nations. You know, then you end up having the, you know, the conquest of the land, uh, which takes, you know, place under Joshua. And, you know, I'm, I'm skipping over some pretty big sections of history here. But, you know, Israel, they do, be, they do become a kingdom. And uh, they actually go for quite a while without having a specific king. But we know that when you hit, you know, the books of Samuel and Kings, that you see the development of actually having kings within uh, Israel. So, you know, Saul comes on the scene, David comes on the scene, Solomon, then eventually you're going to have, you know, the divided kingdom after that. So I do believe that Israel is operating as a nation, as a kingdom before they actually get a king. But, you know, Genesis 17, I think verse 6 indicated that there were going to be kings that were going to come from Abraham. So I think kings, you know, were always going to be part of the plan. And then uh, David is going to be very strategic uh, you know, and this is where I would refer you back to our discussion of the Davidic covenant. Second Samuel chapter seven, verses 12 to following indicate that the kingdom program is going to include a line of David or an ultimate son of David would come who would have a universal rule. Mentioned here on point number five, the kingdom of God on earth with Israel reached its high point under the first three kings with Solomon, yet it ended with the Babylonian captivity. So we could say that the, the time period for the kingdom is roughly, you know, 1400 to 600 as far as Israel uh, being a kingdom and, you know, having a, an, an autonomy. But remember what was talked about in the Mosaic Covenant, we alluded to it in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, that the way for Israel to be related to the blessings of the Abrahamic Covenant was to keep, be keeping the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant was the means through which any particular generation of Israel could be linked with the blessings of the Abrahamic Covenant. But they failed, and as your Bible Old Testament survey classes revealed in your own private study, that after all kinds of warnings and after actually all kinds of grace being poured out by God, there was continual resistance and breaking of the Mosaic Covenant, which led to dispersion, which led to the Assyrian captivity in 722, the Babylonian captivity of the, of the two southern tribes in 605 BC. So what was, what was promised in Deuteronomy 28 to 30 took place. Remember how we talked about that in Deuteronomy 30? You know, they're, they're not even in the conquest of the land yet. And God says, after you've been there and after you've been kicked out because you disobeyed, <laughs> well, that happens. They, they, they break the covenant and they end, up, they end up being kicked out. But as they are dispersed, that doesn't mean the end. That doesn't mean the end of what, what God is doing with Israel. Now, I think that we can say that as a result of what they've done, there is a sense in which Israel has failed in its mission. I mean, there's no doubt about it. They're supposed to be a set-apart nation, to be a witness to the rest of the nations, and, and they fail. And that's why, uh, man, because they failed, there's going to have to be an ultimate Israelite, Jesus Christ, who will come along and be everything that Israel was intended to be so that he can restore the nation and bring blessings to uh, the Gentiles of the earth. So what ends up happening is with the end of the kings and with the, of Israel and with the dispersion that is taking place, who pops up on the scene to be the main purveyors of what God desires? It's the prophets. So the prophets come on the scene, you know, and they're prophets. And as they're prophets, they're doing a couple of things. One of them is that they're issuing warnings and coming judgment to, to the people of Israel. They're you know, they're, they're proclaiming the, the coming captivities and they're talking about hardship because of the breaking of the Mosaic Covenant. And they're also predicting a new covenant that's going to come. So with Jeremiah and with Ezekiel, when things are very, very bleak, there's the promise in Jeremiah 31. God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you, not like the one that you broke, 
when you, know, you came out of the land of Egypt and I gave you the Mosaic Covenant. So you're going to have those, that warning aspect and that, you know, the, the judgment. And they won't be very popular people, right? They're going to be persecuted and killed and all those sorts of things. And they're also predicting future days. They're, they're talking about eschatological days that are to come. And that's where, you know, as I start to mention here, you start to have a lot of the, a lot of the prophets, you know, predicting, you know, what, what will be taking place. You know, we remember we spent a, a whole, almost a whole class talking about Acts 15 and Amos 9. So I won't go over that again. But remember, Amos 9, 11 to 15 is talking about that there's going to there's going to come a day in which the the fallen booth of David is going to be rebuilt, which means that Davidic kingdom that was established and was really at a high point with David and Solomon, but then eventually, you know, became dilapidated and eventually dispersed. It's going to be rebuilt. And what's going to happen in those days, according to verses you know, 11 and 12, yeah, there's going to even be Gentile nations who are going to be called by my name. So the Gentiles will be related to that kingdom. And then I think verses 14 and 15 talked about blessings for the land of Israel. So there's great days to come when the Davidic kingdom is restored and both Gentiles and Israel are benefiting uh, from that kingdom. Uh, let's look at... We're going to spend it. We are going to go to Daniel 2. I wrote that down there, so I made sure I didn't forget. But, but let's look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. You could do a whole couple of classes just on the kingdom in Isaiah. But, yes? Israel's kingdom with real kings would be in almost a thousand years. Or... Has no one ever, brought, have you ever read anything about yeah, that? You mean like the 1400, yeah, the, uh, the, the roughly 1200? Yeah. Um, if there are, I haven't heard too many people make, make, make too much of that. Um, I don't want to say that there isn't any or somebody hasn't made connections, but I, 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 I haven't heard anybody make, make a whole lot out of that. Okay, when uh, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, I know what's discussed in verse 2. Now it will come about that in the last days. So it's talking about future days here. The mountain of the house of the Lord, and mountain is often associated with kingdom. So the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. There appears to be this, you know, the nations, you know, streaming to Jerusalem. Verse 3, and many peoples will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So it appears to be Jerusalem's the capital at this particular time. Verse 4, but again, notice that this isn't just for Israel. Verse 4 says, and he will judge between the nations, which seems to indicate there that he has to make executive kingly judicial decisions. He will judge between the nations. He will render decisions for many peoples, which indicates that there's decisions that need to be made. Verse 4, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. So that's indicating, you know, peaceful conditions. And you have a, a, what appears to be a righteous ruler who's judging, who's making decisions. It appears to be incredible, you know, uh, peace during this particular time. Uh, I mean, if you think about this, you know, when it talks about these weapons, you know, they're going to hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Think how many trillions of dollars are put into military budgets, even to today. And just, just kind of go there with me for a second. Just think if conditions were such that nations were no longer at war with each other and all of their resources could be devoted towards other better, I shouldn't say better because I know in a fallen world you need to have a defense. I'm not, I'm not saying there's not a good side of that, but just think of all the money that could go for positive purposes that today has to go towards military purposes. And that's even in a fallen world. I mean, even in a fallen world, if all of a sudden all this money could somehow go towards <laughs> positive purposes, that would be a dramatic change even now. But imagine in the righteous kingdom of the Messiah, you know, what that would be like. So the main thing to get from here is, you know, Isaiah is talking about, you know, the days are coming in which there's going to be, you know, this kingdom headquartered in Jerusalem and this individual who we know is the Messiah is going to be making righteous 
decisions and judgments and the nations are not going to be at war with each other anymore. If you look, since we're in Isaiah, let's go ahead and look at Isaiah chapter 9. You know, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. You know, you know, some of these things you see fulfillment in the ministry of Christ, including being a light to the Gentiles. So verse 2 says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And then you jump over to the very familiar verse 6, which we often hear this verse a lot at Christmas time, although we should hear it much more than just Christmas time. But chapter 9, verse 6, where it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government, notice it mentions government there, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And I would tie that with what the angel told Mary, you know, in Luke 1, 32 to 33. You know, he's going he's gonna to reign over the house of Jacob forever. So notice there, the government will rest on his shoulders. And that's what come I'm not afraid to talk about, that in in the eschatological kingdom, there's a governmental aspect. There's a, there's a governmental, social, political aspect to the kingdom of God. Now, some people, when they hear that, they cringe, and I can under, I kind of understand that, because today, what, when we think of governments and political, social structures, what do we think of? We think of corruption. We think of how bad that is. But we see here, the government's going to rest on its shoulders. So I don't think government is inherently bad. It's just corrupted, fallen man is what makes it really bad. But when Christ is ruling and reigning, uh, it's going to be a very, very positive thing. And then it says, you know, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. So I think that's pretty similar to Isaiah 2, picturing the great... uh, conditions that are taking place on earth at the time of the Messiah's return. I would also, since we're so close, this is almost since we're so close, we just have to look at it sort of thing. But look at uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from its roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, and all those sorts of things that are associated with Christ, and I would even say has some initial fulfillment with the you know, with the first coming. But notice when you get to verse 4, uh, Isaiah eleven four 4 says, But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And it says in the next part, And he will strike the earth with the, with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Verse 5, Righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Verse 6, I noticed in my notes here, I, uh, I mentioned this as animal kingdom harmony. The, wealth, the, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the diaper's Uh, on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So I believe in the restoration of all things. And I would see this as probably being the millennial phase of that restoration of all things. You're actually seeing the animal kingdom in harmony. You know, when I read that, I go back to here and I think of this. The birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the animals... You know, if, if the animal kingdom is a substantial part of the original creation, why wouldn't the animal kingdom be a, a substantial part of the restoration of all things? So I think what you're seeing there is you're seeing the developing of the, of the restoration of the, of the animal kingdom, which is part of the, of the, of the restoration of all things. So I, do, I believe there's animals in the eschaton. I totally believe that. I, 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 first of all, I, just, I believe this passage is explicitly staying. I don't see any reason to spiritualize this. I think that's a literal. Go ahead. This is a, um, more of a big picture question, but I have trouble understanding how uh, some parts of the Bible fit into this, uh, I guess, total redemptive history kingdom thing. Like, how does the return from exile and even Jesus's ministry, when he when he comes and he's talking about the kingdom all the time and he says like the kingdom is near, how does that fit into this whole idea of the kingdom? It seems that like we're jumping from Israel all the time to millennium. 
Yeah, and so how do you relate the, the message of the nearness of the kingdom, like with what's going to be going on in the future? Yeah, how do those things fit in? I just have to process. Yeah, that'll be, I'll give you a short answer now. That's something we will get into, we're going to be getting into in our discussion of these two days. I think, I think when he preached the nearness of the kingdom, there was a sense in which it was imminent and on the brink. But it didn't arrive at that particular time because of the rejection of Christ, but does, does come at the second coming. Part of the reason why I believe that is, is when Matthew 3, 2 and Matthew 4, 17 talk about the kingdom is near, the kingdom is at hand, which I would take to be that it's imminent, it's on the brink. After Matthew 12 and the, and the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, you never see the kingdom presented as near or at hand again. And then in Luke 21, either verse 30 or 31, when Jesus is talking about the future tribulation period, he says, when you see these things, then you know the kingdom is near. So it goes from being near to not near to near in the future. And I'll go through some passages trying to defend that more. But even like in Luke 19, 11 to 27, he gave them a, the, a parable to show them that the kingdom wasn't going to be established right away, which I think has to do with Israel's rejection of him. So what I'm saying, like in the Old Testament, it predicted Messiah and kingdom. And so when it talks about Messiah, it talks about these blessings. When the New Testament comes along, the New Testament gives us, tells us that the Messiah is coming has two phases to it. So these sorts of things that we're talking about, I think, end up being the second phase. That's kind of my short answer. Yep, Adam. Do you hear you say you believe it's a uh, talk about the millennial? Right. millennium. Um, is that just because it talks about the judgment aspect? Right. I think they're like, I would say this, like in verse four, when it talks about, but with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. There still seems to be conditions that appear to be more millennial-like than eternal state-like. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. What I was going to say, is that how you, I mean, is that pretty much your criteria throughout Isaiah on whether it's... Yeah, a, that's a great question. Like, what's my criteria? Like, it's, it's a great question. I think Isaiah, when he's talking about the latter days and the new heaven and the new earth, I think he's seeing what's to come in when the Messiah's kingdom is established as a unit. Later, Revelation will come along and tell us that there's two phases to those coming days. And so my, what, 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 I, what I think is taking place is I think there are certain things that because of prog progressive revelation, we can look back now and say that's probably in the millennium. This, is pro this part's probably in the eternal state. I personally believe that there's a lot of continuity between the millennium and the eternal state even though that there, can be some, you know, there can be some discontinuity as well. One, one of the things that I would say is, well, let me give you this example. Then this might be a good time to address this. Like, like let's look at Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24. And th my, the point that I'm making here is I think even Isaiah gives hints of there being two aspects, like a millennial phase and, a, and an eternal state phase. Like if you look in... Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24 is talking about a, a global tribulation upon the earth, what I consider to be the day of the Lord. And then, you know, it's talking about all these things. Almost, it, as a matter of fact, the book of Revelation picks up on a lot of this language. You know, verse 19 talks about the earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently, it reels to and fro like a drunkard. This is the tribulation period. But then when you look at verse 21, Notice what it says. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. That sounds just like the end of Revelation 19 with the second coming where you end up having the evil forces dealt with and the kings of the earth. So it talks about the Lord is going to punish them. And then you look in verse 22. This is really interesting. It says, they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon and will be confined in prison now notice this, and after many days they will be punished. So notice, even in Isaiah, everybody always thinks Revelation 1920 is the only passage that talks about an intermediate era. Isaiah is talking about global tribulation day of the Lord. Then he's talking about a gathering of the host on high and the kings of the earth. Then they're like prisoners in a dungeon that are conf will be confined in prison, and after many days they will be punished. I think that's indicating an intermediate era which I would call a millennium. And then when you come to chapter 25, it talks about the fact that death, death is finally removed. 
If you look on Isaiah 25, 7 and verse 8, And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over the, all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. So notice this talks about the total removal of death. He's going he's gonna to swallow up death for all time. But, so I would say that that has, I would say this collection of verses indicates tribulation, intermediate kingdom, eternal state. Now, if you jump over to Isaiah 65, Isaiah 65, 17 is talking about new heavens and a new earth. You know, verse 17 says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. But notice one of the conditions of verse 20. It says, in verse 20, it says, No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 shall be thought accursed. So it's actually talking about some sort of death there. But it's not like today. You know, if somebody dies at the age of 100, we don't say, Wow, what happened to you? You must have did something wrong. And that's not true of the eternal state either, right? Because nobody dies. But here it's like there's these, there's these conditions where there is still death, but it's like rare and it's... So what I'm saying is, I think even with Isaiah, he addresses the package of the eschatological events, but there's certain things that we could see to be more millennial and other things to be more eternal state. And the reason we know that is progressive revelation comes along, we get more specifics that there are two eras. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is one of many prophets that talks about a coming kingdom, but he actually is using that terminology of kingdom and, you know, and a coming kingdom, so this is very uh, important. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I think you know, the Son of Man language that you oftentimes find in the Gospels, and particularly in Matthew, seems to be a heavy reliance on the Son of Man figure of Daniel 7, 13 to 14. So there's heavy reliance on Daniel in the Gospels and in... Uh, the, the book of Revelation. Um, this is where you have the, the, the statue dream. You know, it says according to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. So he ends up having these dreams and you know, he calls in his uh, magicians to tell him what the in interpretation is. And, you know, they're not, ab they're not able to do that. So what ends up happening is Daniel is the one who is able to uh, come and reveal what is going on with Nebuchadnezzar's dream. <clears throat> so if you look at verse, uh, let's see, we're going to go ahead and start in verse 28. Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. What you're going to end up having here is a, the dream. Within the dream, it's taken the form of a statue, which seems to represent a succession of Gentile kingdoms that are replaced by God's kingdom. So in a nutshell, that's what this is about. You end up having different aspects of the statue that represent different historical Gentile kingdoms replaced by God's kingdom. According to verse 28... Daniel is talking to him and he says, However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar, who's king of Babylon, you know, what will take place in the latter days. So what's taking place here is going to have a connection with the present from Daniel's time, but it's going to go into the latter days. And then when you look in verse 31, you start to get the explanation here. You, O king, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. So the head of the statue is gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its, leg, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So there ends up being different aspects of here, the gold, uh, the silver, uh, the bronze, and then the iron. And then the last part is partly iron and partly clay. Verse 34, you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands. A stone cut without hands. This appears to be of a, a different from what's before in the sense that it's of divine origin. It's a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. 
So on this very final part of the statue, the part of iron and clay, there comes this destruction to that element, which causes the whole statue to, to disintegrate. Because verse 35 says, Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So you have this statue, this stone cut without hands, comes and utterly obliterates what came before. So much so that it's like chaff blown into the wind. And then what happens with that stone that struck the statue? It becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. Again, mountain, I think, is in reference there to a kingdom. So I, to use this word, we're seeing a replacement here, aren't we? We're seeing here's the statue with these elements in it, and then the stone cut without hands obliterates it and then replaces it and becomes the dominant force on the earth. Verse 36, this was the dream. Now we shall tell you its interpretation before the king. Now notice that you have the dream, which includes this statue, right? And includes symbols. And by the way, it, it, take note of what's going on here in Daniel, because when you get to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation heavily relies on Daniel. And I think when a lot of people get to the book of Revelation, they throw a lot of dust in the air by claiming apocalyptic literature, almost as if it's beyond the realm of any kind of understanding. But I want you to notice that when this is being described, the things that are symbols end up having a literal meaning behind the symbol. Now, sometimes they're ex to we're told what they are and other times we're not. But when there's a symbol, there's a literal meaning behind the symbol. The symbol represents something. I don't think it's just the case that a symbol is given to be purposely confusing to the people of God. Now that doesn't mean in our finiteness and our misunderstandings and cultural gaps and that sort of thing that we, we can't be confused on what a symbol means. But there are literal meanings behind the symbols. So notice there's an interpretation which is given, verse 36. Then verse 37, you, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom the power, the strength, and the glory. Verse 38, And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beast of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. So notice that there. There's a symbol. Head of gold. What does it equal? Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> the head of Babylon. That's, that's the meaning there. So there, there, there's a connection. So that, I think that furthers the point. Literal meaning behind the symbol. Then verse 39, after you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. So just as Nebuchadnezzar is a literal king of a kingdom, after him there's going to be other geopolitical kingdoms that rule. And then, uh, you know, verse 40, then there will, you know, it talks about the fourth kingdom as strong as iron, as, as in as much as iron crushes and shatters all things. Now I want you to pay attention to that because this will be important later. When it talks about this fourth kingdom that's as strong as iron, it shatters all things. So like iron that, cr that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. Verse 41, and that you saw the feet and toes Partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. So the iron kingdom with the legs ends up having a form of it with the feet where it's iron and clay. So I would say within that fourth kingdom, there's what appears to be almost kind of like phases to it. You have the legs of it, but then there's also the feet that are a mixture of clay. Verse 34 you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 42, as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. 
Now notice verse 44 here. In the days of those kings. And he seems to be talking about at the time of the toes of, of, of the ten. Uh, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. So you have these series of these geopolitical ruling kingdoms, and then there appears to be this kingdom that appears to be divine in origin. It comes and crushes them, and it itself is a geopolitical entity that replaces what had come before. Verse 45, inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. So at this particular point, I'm going to shift over to my notes here, you know, on the whole issue of the kingdom program uh, in Daniel 2. I'm not going to read all this because some of it's just stating what we just read. But, but notice the parts of the statue. And of course, you can find all kinds of examples on the internet and maybe even in your own Bible of the, the statue. You probably have you know, seen those before. But you have the, uh, the head of fine gold, the breast and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and then from that legs of iron, the feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Then it talks about the, the stone that was cut without hands. And then, you know, you end up having the... Uh, uh, in, interpretation. We know the first part of the puzzle is explicitly stated to us. The golden head represented Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel does not explicitly say what the remaining three kingdoms of the statue represent, but many scholars have affirmed, and I don't think there's been much disagreement on this, that uh, the breast and arms of silver represented the kingdom of Medo-Persia, which followed the Babylonian kingdom, it's also believed that the belly and thighs of bronze represented the kingdom of Greece and the legs of iron referred to the kingdom of Rome. So, I mean, there's even a lot of early church testimony to the fact that that was the, the, the common uh, understanding. Rome was the most powerful and dominating kingdom of ancient times and is well described by the iron. The feet of iron and clay indicate a kingdom related to the fourth iron kingdom of Rome, but this form of the kingdom in a latter state is not as stable since it has the element of clay associated with it. Daniel says this kingdom is divided, and while strong, it has a brittle element to it. The stone that was cut without hands, that appears to be a reference to the kingdom of God. So it's a stone cut without hands, which seems to indicate it's different in quality from the others. It's divine in origin. It's the kingdom of God that you know, fills the whole world. In the days of those kings, probably a reference back to the ten toes of the feet mentioned in verse 42. So when you put it together, this seems to be what's taking place. Now again, we're, we're looking at Daniel with uh, you know, centuries of hindsight. It appears to be, not, not appears to be at number one, we're, we're told that Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. It appears to be that Medo-Persia was the breast and arms of silver. Greece was the belly and thighs of bronze. Rome the legs of iron, and later form of the Roman Empire uh, would be there. And then number five, you have God's kingdom, a stone cut without hands that becomes a great mountain. The main point of Daniel 2, right here, this is what I would say is the big picture, is that starting with Babylon, there would be four major Gentile powers that would rule over the world in Israel. But a day is coming when God's kingdom will suddenly crush these kingdoms and itself will be established as a geopolitical entity over the entire earth forever. Note, now this is where you, this is where like pre-mills and ah-mills are going to go separate ways on this. I think every, there's going to be a lot of agreement on a lot of these points. You know, agreement on the empires. When it comes to the actual, you know, the, the ten toes and the iron mixed with clay, you're going to have some disagreement on that because there'll, there'll be uh, a lot of non-dispensationalists would say that was fulfilled uh, pretty soon after the time of Christ. You know, futurists and dispensationalists would see that as a coming revived uh, Roman Empire of ten kingdoms that's still in the future. So on this particular aspect, there's going to be some debate on that final form of the empire. God's kingdom coming at the time of the Roman Empire 
there's no debate. The nature of that kingdom, there's a debate. Uh, those uh, who are usually amillennial will say, with Christ first coming, his kingdom did come. And it's more powerful you know, than any geopolitical entity, more powerful than Rome. So for them, the fulfillment of the stone that became a great kingdom takes place at Christ's first coming and with his, you know, his, his life, his death, and his resurrection and ascension. So for them, the fulfillment of the stone cut without hands is taking place now, which is consistent with their views that we're in the Davidic kingdom now, that the millennium is now, so you would have that taking place. The premillennial view would be is that <clears throat> we're still under the time of Gentile powers, and since this kingdom that is made without hands comes and utterly obliterates the Gentile kingdoms. That hasn't happened yet because we still have Gentile kingdoms that are not acknowledging the God of the Bible. So therefore that will take place in the future at the time of the revived Roman Empire that appears to have 10, 10 parts to it. So I would argue here that the main point of Daniel 2 is that starting with Babylon, there would be four major Gentile powers that would rule over the world in Israel. But a day is coming when God's kingdom will suddenly crush these kingdoms and itself will be established as a geopolitical entity over the entire earth forever. Note that when God's kingdom, and again, this is my interpretation as a, as a premillennialist here. Note that when God's kingdom comes, it dramatically and decisively destroys and replaces the existing four Gentile powers that preceded it. It does not coexist as a spiritual kingdom alongside, um, alongside literal. I got the wording there mixed up. It does not coexist as a spiritual kingdom alongside literal kingdoms. I probably got the wording mixed up there. My point here, it doesn't. It's not a spiritual kingdom that coexists with the with the other kingdoms. As McLean states, now it is deeply significant that in these visions the heavenly kingdom comes down and destroys and supplants existing political powers. At one moment, a stone from heaven shatters the Gentile kingdoms, leading to the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. There is no gradual development of God's kingdom. It comes suddenly and decisively. Debate has occurred as to whether this kingdom of God is a spiritual or earthly kingdom. This kingdom of God is spiritual in that it comes from heaven. So it's heavenly origin. But when this kingdom of God comes, it invades earth and takes over the realm in which the other four kingdoms ruled. Thus it is an earthly kingdom as well in that it presides on the earth. The kingdom of God will be spiritual in origin, but earthly in regard to the sphere of its existence and domain. So what I'm arguing for here is a, is a replacement, a dramatic, sudden, cataclysmic replacement, not a, a spiritual kingdom that comes alongside geopolitical Gentile entities <clears throat> and exists alongside of those. So this earthly aspect of God's kingdom is evident in a connecting point between the fourth kingdom, Rome, and the fifth kingdom, God's kingdom. <clears throat> Remember I told you earlier when it talks about the fourth kingdom shatters all things and breaks in pieces its enemies, which is what Rome did. There is a parallel here. Um, you know, likewise, the fifth kingdom of God's kingdom will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. So just as Rome shattered their enemies, God's kingdom, when it comes, breaks in pieces you know, the, the enemies that are on the scene of its, of its time. So there is a parallel here. Just as the fourth kingdom of Rome crushed all rival political kingdoms on earth, so too the kingdom of God will crush the earthly political kingdoms on the scene when it comes. The coming of God's kingdom is not progressive, taking place over time. It is sudden. This is a stone that violently brings an end to the kingdoms that preceded it. The kingdoms that used to exist are like chaff that is swept away by strong winds. <clears throat> Like the previous four kingdoms, God's kingdom is a real geographical and political kingdom that will exist over the entire earth. It radically replaces the Gentile kingdoms that came before it. And in reference to Daniel 2, Craig Blazing states, this kingdom is not simply a higher order of spiritual reality that coexists with the present course of affairs, but it is a complete replacement of present conditions on earth with a new worldwide and multinational order. <clears throat> So anyway, that would, that would be uh, my understanding of that passage, which seems to me to indicate real literal kingdom, replacement of Gentile kingdoms, not just a coexisting uh, together. And I think that would be a fair understanding of the, uh, 
of the passage from a literal standpoint. Yep. When, when he makes the statement that it's not a, uh, a gradual, progressive growth or it's a sudden appearing, uh, is, do you think some people, when they get to the Gospels and Jesus, you know, in his parables, talking about uh, the mystery of the kingdom? Uh, I mean, my understanding is that he's emphasizing the citizen aspect of the kingdom, where it's here. We're looking at right. the uh, right. geographical, political aspect. I think that's well said. So there's no doubt. I think still kingdom, right. I think Matthew 13 and the mustard seed. I mean, that the, I think that's indicating the growth of the nucleus of people that are citizens of that of that coming kingdom. But I think you're right as far as this geopolitical establishment. It's at the time of the second coming. <clears throat> all right, I saw a hand here. We'll go here and then we'll go down this way. Uh, how do you think like all this relates about like it's talking about the earth, but then when we think about it, it's not actually the earth, right? I mean, there's like people in America, Asia, Africa who aren't part of this. Um, so like is it kind of just like um, accommodation? He's not really talking about the whole earth when he's talking about the kingdoms that are... Well, I, I would say that because I'm a futurist, I would say that the reigning power at the time, the reigning dominant world power would be, would be this. I mean, of course, I would, I would still see all the nations as we know them today as still existing, <clears throat> but it would seem to me that the centralized form of power would be a revived... Roman Empire with those 10 elements from it of which the little horn of Daniel 7 would come from. So, um, I mean, like, does it have to be like the whole earth or can it just be that area in the Middle East? Well, I would say, I think the language indicates that it fills the whole earth. So, so what I think, what I think, thank you, that, that's helpful. Um, well, let's just put it this way. When you look at those other kingdoms, you know, the, the kingdom of Rome and, and all those, they, obviously because of technology and space are not necessarily able to go to every single inch, inch, but there's a sense in which they're the dominant power. They don't consider their realm to be limited at all on the earth. If they can get there, it's theirs. <laughs> so there's a sense even where you have a localized headquarters with the country, but there's still a, in a sense, a worldly, under, a, a, a universal understanding of their domain. <clears throat> so when that gets overthrown, you can end up saying the world power of that time was overthrown. So I think at this particular time, you'll have a revived Roman Empire, of which is the, again, because you're also dealing with the Antichrist and his rule, so you're getting into global you know, implications there, that when, when, when that is overthrown, that affects the whole entire planet. So I think it ends up being, having implications for the whole planet. Yeah, let's go to Adam, and then we'll come to... Um, so <clears throat> maybe I've missed it, or maybe I'm still missing it. As far as, okay, so Babylon was uh, past and then Medo Persian, Greece, and then we're jumping yeah, to the future of Rome, of a reestablished Rome. Rome I would kingdom. say that there ends up being a revived Roman Empire that from our standpoint is still future. So and part of the reason why I would say that is because when, you, when John is writing the book of Revelation in the 90s, he's using Daniel's language and even his time periods, like three and a half months or 42 months and 1260 days. So he's I would say that's one of the implications of two comings of Christ. Certain things fulfilled the first, other things that will come in the second. I would say the revived Roman Empire and the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel and all that is connected with the events of the second coming. Oh, yeah, I guess. In history, Greece, you know, then <coughs> uh, it was Greece and then it was the Roman Empire. Right. Um, yeah, so not just Roman Empire though, but then another uh, another aspect of it. Yeah, it goes from iron to iron mixed with clay. So I mean, are you, you said it was back then as well as future is both. Well, I would say when it comes about. to the Fourth Empire, I would say that there's a already not yet aspect. <laughs> We've already seen the legs of iron with the Roman Empire fulfilled historically because that was the dominating power at the time of Christ. I think the part of iron mixed with clay. I think that aspect is still future. And part of the reason why I believe that is because, like I said, when you gotta remember, Christ is dying in the 30s, and John is writing in the 90s, and he's talking about the future. He's drawing on the language of Daniel, the kingdoms of Daniel, the time periods of Daniel. So John is seeing this stuff as being future. So I'm not saying you're saying this, but if somebody were to say, well, that seems kind of arbitrary to have this big gap, I think that's what the apostles are doing. I mean, I think that's what John 
is doing. And I would say, again, that's part of the implications of there being two comings of Christ, that there ends up being, in a sense, a delay of some of the aspects of the, uh, of it. All right. So we like do prophetic passages whenever we try to understand them. It seems like this would prevent Christ from coming back. Like he can't come back today because his kingdom has to, unless I guess that's where you'd have to hold to a pre-tribulational rapture so that these things. Well, not even necessarily. I mean, the thing is, is it's the, it's the day of the, the day of the Lord is the thing that initiates the chain of events of the final things. And that's always presented as imminent. So the day of the Lord could break out in five seconds or it could break out in 200 years. So it's the day of the Lord that is imminent, which includes the complex of these, these events. So, so, this would happen, this would happen so in other words, I always hate to play the hypothetical game, but technically a revived form of the Roman Empire, which some would actually believe is, if you look at what's been taking place in Europe, there could be stirrings of that sort of thing. Could be, if the day of the Lord were to break out tomorrow, I, this sort of scenario with those, with this kind of form of a revived Roman Empire would be in play. Yeah. So the only one that's really set in stone is Babylon, but this is prophetic. So how come countries like what you were saying there, how come countries like China or even America aren't even in there? Because like I said, this is all prophetic. Right. So now why aren't they a part of the statue? I mean, because you could technically argue that America is crushing other countries right. like, like Ireland does. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I would say that I don't, but I don't necessarily think the statue is claiming that this has to include every single, every single world power that has ever existed. I mean, the thing that it's claiming is, is you end up having these four and then a revived form of the four. So, I mean, we know as time has played out, I mean, there ends up being other, other world powers. Some have tried to argue that even the world powers after that are, in a sense, continuations. Of, you know, I'm not going to get into all that. I don't know. I, I don't know how much validity there is into that. Um, <clears throat> but it seems to emphasize these five: the fact that we're living. There's there's a gap between the first and second coming, which allows there to be others. The thing that would have to be the case is that when the end and the day of the Lord break out, that that fifth part is there. Yep, Jesse. Um, yeah, kind of just going on with all these guys' questions. How do we, has anyone ever interpreted uh, the fifth kingdom or the, the second Roman Empire as, you know, um, Constantine? And yeah, I mean, there's, out of I mean, Preterists would argue there's first century fulfillment, which I think is hard. I mean, I, mean I, I think there's certain pieces of the puzzle that they can try to make fit, but to describe the, 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 ten, the ten toes part of it, where the kingdom's divided into ten, that, I think that's a hard, hard sell. But, but, yeah, but clearly there and this gets into the whole, you're, right now we're dealing, in, we're getting into an issue where there's a lot of debate, which is the whole issue of gaps in the timing of prophecy. That's also true in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. You know, I believe there's a future 70th week of Daniel, which is a seven year period to come. There's others who believe, no, that had to be fulfilled in the first century. But I think when you start looking at the details, okay, how did that look as far as it being fulfilled in the first century? I don't think you see the fulfillment. <laughs> so... I will grant that is a, that is a debated issue. The whole issue of the uh, of, of 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 there being a gap. Is there another? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering, like, we were talking about how in Revelation, John um, is talking about kind of a future form of Roman Empire, right? Because um, it's talking about kings and right. Like, well, I was wondering like, how firm you would you hold. To these are there any other reasons why we think that that the second, third kingdoms are you know, Persia and Greece, or or is it open that maybe we don't know yet, and then when we look back, we'll be like, oh, obviously, like the second kingdom was Rome, and then the third kingdom was whatever. Oh yeah. After, so in other words, it, I mean, because there's a sense in which, since we're not told two, three, and four like we are one, is it possible from our standpoint that we're? Yeah, you know, it's. I would say, could it be possible? Because since it's not stated, we may be misunderstanding. I would say that it's possible, but I would say it's highly, highly unlikely. And I think 
a lot of it has to do with the fact of the Messiah coming at the time of Rome with the potentiality of the whole package of the eschatological events to unfold. So if it ends up being the case that Christ, the Messiah, comes at the time of four with the potential of five, it would seem to me that two and three probably have come before. But that, that's, a good, that's a good question. All right, so that would... I guess one, one thing to think about here, and this will inter, interact with how you view New Testament use of the Old Testament. I mean, it would, it would you know, there, there could be, you know, as far as whether there's time gaps or not, all that sort of thing, there could be some debate. But it seems to be, from just this passage, without taking into account other passages, it's, this seems to indicate that you have Gentile geopolitical entities that are replaced by a divine geopolitical entity. The kingdom comes and actually, God's kingdom comes and rules in the realm where those Gentile kingdoms formerly were ruling. So I would say I think a literal contextual understanding of this would point towards an earthly kingdom. Now what's going to come into play is, is, well, how come there are amillennialists who don't believe what I've just talked about? They believe the kingdom of God was established. They believe that the New Testament can and will transcend the trajectory of what was talked about in passages like these. So what appeared to be geopolitical conclusions end up being more spiritual. For example, let me read to you uh, some aspects. I'm not saying he directly ad addresses the Daniel part in his chapter here, but in uh, Riddle, Kim Riddlebarger's The uh, Case for Amillennialism, I just, I just want to bring this up to show the other side. You know, he's in his chapter, The Kingdom of God. He's going to make some points here. I want to. Uh, you know, he, he, makes some, he makes some statements here about the, the, because of the New Testament, the kingdom becomes pr uh, primarily spiritual. You know, he says, uh, you know, but th this would have been a thoroughly secularized and politicized kingdom. In many ways, it is the kingdom envisioned by the dispensationalist and post -millenarian. So he's getting after the dispensationalist for believing that there's a political aspect to the kingdom of God. But this is what he says here. This is Riddlebarger saying, Jesus spoke of a different kingdom where God would bring deliverance from humanity's true enemy, the guilt and power of sin, because Jesus did not offer the economic, political, and nationalistic kingdom so many in Israel longed for, he was put to death. And then he'll say here on page 109, uh, six, the kingdom was present because Jesus declared it was a spiritual kingdom. And then later on with this underline here, you know, Jesus' kingdom was a spiritual kingdom, completely unlike the nationalistic kingdom which Israel expected. This should also be a caution to those who would see Jesus' kingdom in terms of nationalism or secular progress in economics, politics, and culture. All right, this is the part, this is the part I think that most directly relates to what we're talking about. <clears throat> he says this, you know, after quoting passages which you think are talking about the spiritual nature of the kingdom, this raises serious questions about attempts to equate the kingdom of God in the New Testament with Old Testament pre-Messianic motifs. So catch that, that, let that sink in. He's talking about the whole issue of the New Testament and the Old Testament expectation. This raises these verses of the New Testament that he thinks are talking about the kingdom being spiritual in nature, raises serious questions about attempts to equate the kingdom of God in the New Testament with Old Testament pre-Messianic motifs, such as a restoration of national Israel or a spatial physical kingdom that manifests itself on this earth in a geopolitical matter, manner. So now I was just arguing for in Daniel too, is there is a geopolitical spatial <laughs> manner aspect to the kingdom of God. But it seems to me he's indicating here that with the New Testament, that's, that's getting changed or altered or transcended. To do this, in other words, to take that the kingdom could be physical or geopolitical, to do this is to say that the Old Testament picture of the kingdom, although a type of the glorious kingdom yet to come at the eschaton, is the ultimate reality. Thus, Old Testament prophecy intended to point to the glorious messianic age now predicts a return to the shadows and types instead of the reality to which they pointed. Ironically, dispensationalism anticipates a bleak eschatological future 
since it insists on returning to Old Testament types as the ultimate reality instead of the reality they represent in the eternal state. You know, to look for a rebuilt temple, to Jesus sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem, you know, to babies being born and daily life continuing after Christ's return empties the kingdom and the age to come of its eternal character. So I think the thing to notice here is what he's saying is that those Old Testament passages that seem to talk about geopolitical, physical, national aspects, that's not, that, that gets transcended by the New Testament. So now that would be the area where, again, that's one of those fault lines where <laughs> I think all mills and pre-mills go in different directions. Because as I argued before, I think the better view is that the New Testament is relying and building upon the Old Testament meaning, but it's not transcending it. So it would appear, I'm saying appearing, that he would see what appears to be a geopolitical entity in Daniel 2 is actually typological of a greater spiritual reality. And I would say it's not. I, I would just take it for what it is and that it'll come, come, come to being. Yep, Adam? For clarification, maybe maybe this is what you're saying. I, don't, I guess I'm asking. Okay. Um, uh, because it says that uh, God's kingdom must come after the Roman uh, kingdom or empire. It has right. to come during the final form of the of the clay and the and the iron. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, that since it didn't happen in the first coming, I mean those same. Uh, things must be taking place for because it's in the second prophetic. Time. So no matter what, there has to be a Roman Empire that the right. God's kingdom comes yeah. in. Basically, this would be my view. Whatever God promised to happen, if it hasn't happened yet, it will in the future. And because there are two comings of Christ, we see several examples of that. If you read Zechariah 9.9, 9, he came humbly as a king to Jerusalem. That was fulfilled as triumphal entry. But verse 10 talks about his reign from sea to sea. You know, I would see that as future. Jesus in Luke 4 quotes Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, and he talks about coming humbly, but then he leaves out the part about the day of vengeance of our God, which talks about the day of the Lord. So I think because there's two comings of Christ, you see several cases where certain things have already been fulfilled, but there's other aspects that are still to come. So I would actually say, I see the first four, including Rome, already having occurred, but the second part of the iron mixed with clay is still being future. And part of the reason why I think that would be the case is not only does John refer to those things as future when he's writing in the 90s, but I, I don't see, I, ha, I haven't seen the kingdom of God actually replace the Gentile kingdoms with the geopolitical entity yet. And, you know, somebody like Riddlebarger would say, I'm wrong because I'm being too literal with the old and I'm not understanding that the New Testament has transcended all that stuff, which is typological according to him, and now the kingdom's primarily spiritual. So like in his chapter, you're seeing this language all the time. It's not physical, it's not national, it's spiritual. I say that's a false dichotomy. I say it's spiritual. I mean, it's a stone cut without hands, so it's a spiritual kingdom because it's actually coming from heaven and, it's, and it's, it's made by God, but it actually invades the realm of the Gentile kingdoms. So I think you can be spiritual in a sense in its nature or spiritual in the sense of its origin, but still have physical uh, elements to it as well. Yeah. All right, any other thoughts? Yep, Tavis. The language of becoming a great mountain, does this refer to a process that's occurring, like people being added to the kingdom? Is that what it's um, referring to? I don't think in this case that it is. I mean, I, I think it's referring, it, it, re it replaces those. It, it instantly obliterates so in a sense, there's a vacuum that's left because of the obliteration of what before, and so it's the only thing that's remaining. Now, I do believe with progressive revelation that Matthew 13 does indicate that because there's two comings of Messiah, which the Old Testament did not explicitly state, that there is an aspect of the kingdom program in effect today as those who are believers in Christ qualify themselves to enter the kingdom when it comes. So I do believe that they're, what is taking place today is part of the kingdom program as the nucleus of that kingdom is, is being formed and growing. And then when Christ comes again, he brings his kingdom reign with him and the judgment of the enemies and then the rewards for the believers. So that's what I think the mustard seed is about. Are there some who take it that, that stone that breaks the feet? Mm -hmm. um, was the first coming of Christ and that now? Yes, because the kingdom for them is a, it's a primarily a spiritual kingdom. So remember that with the amillennial view, 
with Christ's first coming, the kingdom was established. The, but the kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And it's not a geopolitical entity, which I would say that they may believe the New Testament indicates that, but I'm not seeing that in Daniel. And I don't see it in the New Testament either, to be honest. Let's see if we've got a few minutes left. I mean, if you look over in Daniel 7, I'm not going to go through Daniel 7 as in-depthly as I did Daniel 2, but Daniel 7 strongly parallels the statue, but it gives the, uh, the four beast. <clears throat> you see, there's, there's the vision of the four beast that's given in Daniel 7. In verse 4, it talks about a lion. Then in verse 5, it talks about a bear. Then in verse 6, it talks about a leopard. And then after that, the fourth one is a terrible beast, you know, which I think would uh, parallel what we just talked about with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. You do have the, in in verses 9 to 13, you do have the father, the ancient of days. If you jump down to verse... uh, Verse 13, it says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So there you have the son of man figure, which is heavily, that son of man language is used by Christ a lot. And then if you jump down to Daniel chapter 7, I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will rise from the earth. But notice verse 18, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and for all ages. Then if you jump down to verse 21, I kept looking... And that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. So it refers to this horn who's, uh, in other places, referred to as a little horn who's like a negative figure who's waging war against the saints. I would think that, I think that's the Antichrist. But then verse 22 says, Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So you have this negative little horn. He's doing his thing against God. But the Ancient of Days comes, there's judgment passed, and notice the saints took possession of the kingdom. So this is one thing I want you to be thinking of when you're thinking about the kingdom and the kingdom reign of Christ. Daniel 7 seems to be making a pretty strong connection between the reign of the Messiah and the reign of the saints. Because in verse 22 it talks about, you know, at the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So... When you're thinking through, when is Christ reigning as Davidic king? I also want to ask yourself, what's my role in that reign right now? (laughs) In other words, is, you know, if if Messiah is reigning, that probably means saints are reigning. But is that the, is that the picture that the New Testament presents? Did did the saints, are the saints of today presented as reigning in a kingdom? Uh, If you look at verse 24, It says, as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for time, times, and half a times, which appears to be three and a half years. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. And at this point, the revelation ended. So it seems to be talking about a time of peril for the people of God. There ends up being a destruction of the the evil powers and the the little horn. And then the, uh, the kingdom is given to the saints of the Most High. <clears throat> yes, Thomas. In this passage, are you near saints of the Most High? Are you, do you presume that this is speaking of Jews in the tribulation? 
I think, because I mean, yeah. obviously, we today when we see saints in the side, we automatically think like, okay, church or whatever. Yeah. But I think in this particular things. context, it's most specifically focusing on the Jewish people. I think later revelation will make clear that that the people of God is expanded to include Gentiles. So I do think the nucleus of the people of God gets expanded. So in Revelation, you can talk about those from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation that will be a part of it. So I think it's one of those. I mean, I wouldn't read Gentiles into this passage. I think later Revelation will indicate that it's also going to include them. <clears throat> Thus, this is what I would, as, I'll, just, I'll just close on this verse. And what we'll do next class is we'll, we'll go into the New Testament. I, I wanted to talk about these Old Testament passages as a foundation. But we'll go into the New Testament next time. But if you look at Revelation 5, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. <clears throat> this would be, <clears throat> in a nutshell, Revelation 5.10, I think, encapsulates the relationship of the kingdom of God before it starts and then what it'll be like later. Like in, in Revelation 5.10, we're told, you have made them to be a kingdom <clears throat> and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So what I think is taking place now, and I'm doing a little bit of theologizing, and I'm bringing in Matthew 13. <clears throat> I think there's a sense in which we today, as members of, of, of the body of Christ and of the church, we're part of the nucleus of the kingdom. I think whenever anybody gets saved, remember, unless a man's born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. When a person is saved they are qualified to enter the kingdom of God and therefore become the nucleus of that kingdom. So you have made them to be a kingdom, but it says they will reign upon the earth. And as you read how the book of Revelation unfolds, that kingdom comes with the second coming of Christ. It's after the second coming, thrones are established. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 5. Revelation 2, 26 to 27, when Jesus comes again, he's going to grant those who are his to rule the nations. So be clear on this, as I'm, as I'm talking about the kingdom being future, I'm not saying that the kingdom program has no relationship to today. What I'm saying is its primary relationship is we preach the gospel, which qualifies people to be saved and enter the kingdom when it comes. Right now we're persecuted. <laughs> we're going to the nations and the nations don't like us. And I know in the United States it's a little bit different, but for the history of Christianity it's been governments and nations don't like Christians. They kill them. <laughs> but that's going to be replaced someday, and it's going to actually be the saints who are reigning when the Messiah comes again. So I do think we're, we're the nucleus of the kingdom. We're to exhibit kingdom righteousness in our lives. We're to, we're to mirror kingdom relationships as we interact with each one, one another in the church. But the reign of the kingdom will take place with the second coming.